Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And welcome to our second webinar of the fall series. Uh, this one is on OER and accessibility, a very important topic. And I'm just so happy to have Amanda Coolidge from Open BC Campus with us this morning and Emily Moore from the FET Simulations uh, team at University of Colorado. So welcome, everybody. Um, for those of you who might be brand new this morning um, to our Blackboard Collaborate system, I want to let you know that we use the California Community College Blackboard Collaborate system, and we thank them for that. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is that to, throughout the webinar, we uh, welcome your comments um, and questions, um, and we ask that you use the chat window um, for those until the very end when we'll have an open Q&A period. Um, the chat window should be at the bottom left of your screen, and you can just type in there, and uh, we'll answer questions as we get a chance to. Um, so today, um, after we do some, we're going to meet our presenters here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to have a quick overview of CCC OER as usual, our little commercial break there, and um, then we're going to talk about um, why OER and accessibility are such, uh, how they intersect and why they're so important. Um, they have similar missions. And then we'll jump right into um, hearing about the Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit uh, that Amanda has led at BC Campus, and then we will talk, uh, we will hear from Emily on the FET interactive simulations and all the great work they're doing there to make those accessible to all students. All right. At this time, I'm going to give my presenters a chance to say hello and tell you a little bit about their day jobs. And I think we'll go ahead and start with Amanda. Sure, thanks, Una. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Coolidge, and um, I'm the Senior Manager of Open Education at BC Campus. So my role is to work with the team um, at in our Open Education area and work on creating, adapting, and uh, working on mainstream adoption of open textbooks. Great, and we're so glad to have Amanda back with us again uh, to present. And um, now I'd like to give Emily Moore a chance to say hello. And this is Emily's first time joining us. Um, and she's the Director of Accessibility and Research at uh, the FET Interactive Simulations. Emily? Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very delighted to be joining all of you today. I am the Director of Research and Accessibility at the FET Simulations Project. I've been with the FET project for about five years now, and I've been in charge of our research efforts for almost three years now. So we research how to best design the simulations and use them in classrooms. Um, starting last year, I've led our efforts to secure funding to increase our work in accessibility. And a little bit later on, I'll be sharing with you our progress in making accessible interactive simulations. Great. Thank you, Emily. And, and we're very excited to hear more about the FET interactive simulations. They're really exciting science simulations um, that I think uh, many of our faculty could, in, particularly our science faculty, could incorporate into their courses. All right. For those of you who are new to the Community College Consortium for OER, um, our mission since 2007 is expanding access to high quality open materials. Um, we support faculty choice and development, and these webinars are part of that, uh, of fulfilling that mission. And ultimately, uh, our goal is to improve student success, and we know that by expanding access to materials, to open and uh, low-cost materials, that uh, we can really support that. We, um, we have members in um, over 21 states representing um, actually more than 250 colleges at this point. We're probably closer to 300. Um, if you're not a member, um, we, we'd love to uh, invite you to join us um, and find out more about uh, what membership brings. So, um, now I, I want to get to uh, the heart of why we're here this morning. 
Um, and those of you who've worked with me for uh, over the years know that accessibility has been a strong interest of mine for a long time. Um, and and um, part of that, of course, is just interest in, in being able to serve everyone. But OER and accessibility work really well together. Um, and we had a post, uh, this uh, blog post this week from Open Oregon about this very topic called the intersection of accessibility and OER. And if Amy's online, maybe she'll post a link to that uh, blog posting, which um, talks directly to that um, topic. But I want to uh, bring forward some of the statistics about um, students with disabilities. So in the U.S., 11% um, of post-secondary students report a disability um, upon entering college. Um, and I've looked at the Canadian numbers, and Amanda may correct me here, but um, often uh, the statistics are very similar. In fact, I've seen slightly higher statistics, and um, I'll, but I think they're very much in line. Um, is some of it depends on how it's reported, um, where the numbers come from. Um, one thing that um, is interesting is that if you look at students with disabilities and where they attend, um, quite a bit higher percentage attend the two-year colleges than the universities. And um, so I think for those of us who work at the community colleges, we know that um, we do have a lot of students who need extra help in this area. And so this is really part of our mission. Um, in general, statistics show that uh, people with disabilities um, do suffer from a higher poverty rate. Uh, they have generally lower educational and career attainment. So this makes it even more of a strong mission for us uh, to support uh, accessibility in our open resources. Um, legally, of course, um, in the United States, um, the ADA and the American Rehabilitation Act um, all require um, our educational materials to be accessible. Um, once again, that tends to be an ongoing process um, as we add new digital technologies um, to the educational system and in general as they come out um, of our commercial sector. Uh, disability is, or accessibility, I should say, is not always something that uh, new um, entrepreneurs uh, think about. And so um, it's, it's an ongoing job. Um, and so in Canada, there's the Canadian Human Rights Act, which dates from 1985 and also covers uh, many of these same things and guidelines. Um, and with the, with the digital age that we've uh, been in now for, uh, geez, I don't know, I, I guess it depends on, on how you count that, but certainly for the last 25 years, all of our materials are born digital, and so there is the potential for them to be made accessible. Um, but there are guidelines that need to be followed. Um, we, my speakers will tell you a little bit more about those guidelines. We could spend several webinars on those set of guidelines. Um, particularly the international ones, the um, WC3 guidelines. So, so what is the intersection? So the intersection between OER and accessibility is around that affordability and access piece. As I mentioned earlier, um, students and people in general with disabilities do suffer a higher poverty rate. So affordability becomes an even bigger issue for those students. And so when we say we're going to expand access with OER, we need to be keeping in mind those students as well. The wonderful thing about an open license is that it allows modification. So for instance, if you have videos, open videos that don't have captions, those captions can be added so that they can support students who have a hearing impairment. Uh, the same thing for um, images that don't have alt text. Um, the alt text can be added to open documents, open web pages, um, so that those images um, do have um, text for uh, students who have vision impairment. And finally, we all know that the, the right way to do this is really to create accessible OER um, up front um, rather than fixing it. Um, and so Amanda's going to talk about some of the work she's doing with um, faculty authors um, to help them create accessible OER the first time. And also that makes it possible for faculty who, who are coming along later and reusing materials to make sure that they're actually 
uh, reusing materials that are also accessible. All righty. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to Amanda to tell us about the Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit. Great. Thanks, Una. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Amanda, and this presentation, can I actually use it, testing open textbooks for accessibility, um, is based on a collaborative project that we did at BC Campus with another organization called CAPER BC and an instructional designer out of one of our uh, colleges in the area called Camosun College. So just to give you a bit of background, CAPER BC is an organization here in British Columbia that provides al alternate formats to 20 post-secondary institutions across our province. And basically their team makes custom audio books and e-books for textbooks for students with print disabilities. So last year they served about 1,200 students and they already have existing relationships with disability service offices. Um, so that's why we decided to work with them specifically. And then Sue is an instructional designer who worked with us and she's been really um, working in the capacity of universal design for many um, years. So we wanted to tap into her, her expertise as well. So I want to give you a little bit of background in terms of what BC Campus is, because some people often wonder which institution we're affiliated with, and we're not actually. We're an organization that supports the work of the BC, so our British Columbia post-secondary system in the areas of teaching, learning, and educational technology. And we're funded through our uh, Ministry of Advanced Education. Um, so there's three primary areas that we focus on, which is open education and professional learning, collaborative programs and shared services, and student services and data exchange. So the area that I work in and the one that houses the BC Open Textbook Project is open education and professional learning. Um, and these are some of the other things we do as well, if you've heard of any of these other um, pieces. So the BC Open Textbook Project, just to give you another little bit of background, it was um, the ministry's response to uh, issues of student debt and restricted access. So the Open Textbook Project first started in 2012. Um, it was announced by John Yap, who was our Minister of Advanced Education. And the government was going to fund and did fund $1 million in the creation of 40 open textbooks for the highest enrolled post-secondary subject areas. And then in 2013, the government announced that another million dollars would be provided to develop 20 open textbooks in trades. So why are we doing this project as a whole? And this also really relates to the reason why we did the Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit. Um, one is to increase access to higher education by reducing student costs to give faculty more control over their instructional resources and to improve learning outcomes for students. And so like many open textbook projects, we decided um, that we look at the inventory of the subject areas. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So we went ahead and started adopting a number of open textbooks that already existed in the system. And you can see that we got some of these books from a variety of well-known areas. Um, specifically OpenStax and then the Open Textbook Library, et cetera. So we then solicited faculty reviews so that the faculty would review the textbook information. Um, and then they would um, go ahead and identify for us what was missing and what needed to be adapted based on those reviews. And so those adaptions um, came out of those reviews and we just wanted to make sure that whatever was missing or lacking from a textbook in our collection, that it was adapted to meet the needs of our faculty. So in some cases, for example, some of the books were too US-centric, which wasn't relevant for the BC context, and faculty were able to um, change the book to meet specific learning outcomes. We also work in a platform um, called Pressbooks, and um, this is really important because it allows for us to uh, write once and then uh, format out in a variety of different publishing formats. So we've got EPUB, PDF, Mobi, HTML, et cetera. 
and the beauty of this is that it means it gives students a number of choices on the various platforms they can use, and it means that when faculty want to create or adapt or adopt the materials, they can go ahead and use those different formats. And I'm running through these fairly quickly, but you'll see why I'm, I'm just want to get to more of the accessibility information, but wanted to give you a background in terms of where the project is. So what was really important to us, and as with many of the OER projects, is that students have day one access to resources. And so often we hear those complaints that the textbook is backordered, it's out of edition, um, it's not available until the student loan arrives, and what's even more interesting is, as I'll talk about, when we started doing user testing with students who have disabilities, they almost have never started a term with the resources that they need. Because once the instructor identifies which textbook edition they'll be using, that textbook then has to be put into an electronic format if it doesn't already exist. And sometimes they're three weeks to four weeks behind. So just to recap our project, um, Actually, today that number changed. I was saying to Una, our numbers change daily, but we're at 118 open textbooks in our collection. We have 284 adoptions across. So we, I should say, we calculate only in British Columbia. So, um, and 18 institutions across British Columbia are using textbooks. Over 9,000 students are using the open textbooks, and we've saved about $1 million in student savings. So we're really proud of that. And um, you can find these resources at open.bccampus.ca and you'll be able to go through them. So what I want to go through now is really how did we get to the evolution of creating an accessibility toolkit? So what we decided was um, we really wanted to ensure that um, we were, we were living up to the power of open, which for us, as Una pointed out, is really about access and affordability. And we um, really wanted to make sure that students could have day one access to resources, but we also wanted them to give us an idea as to what um, formats they were using, what was important when they would be using those formats, and what were some things that we were missing that we didn't know about that we needed to include to educate faculty a bit better. So our goal was to get about 15 students to test the open textbooks, and in the end we had seven students who completed written feedback, and five students um, attended the in-person focus group. So uh, we actually gave an honorarium of $150, but it was still difficult to recruit people. So our goal was to find student volunteers who were engaged and would give us good concrete feedback. and. Um, we went ahead and spoke with the disability services offices to identify which students might be best suited to do some user testing. So what we decided to do was we picked a good cross-section of content and areas that we knew had some accessibility issues. So for example, English literature, um, we had poetry and footnotes, introduction to psychology, we had issues with tables and images, Intro to Sociology, we had quizzes, um, a long chapter, BC in a global context. This was really fascinating because we had tons of charts, maps, and an embedded Google map, and introductory chemistry images and formula or equations. So what we did is we took these books, and to, be, um, to let you know is that all of these books were either ones that we created or we had adapted. So we weren't user testing any books that we had just adopted. Um, we wanted to take a look at the books we sort of had touched on already. So what we did is um, it was interesting because the five different subject areas that we chose, they didn't necessarily line up with what our student testers were studying. So we gave them the following instructors. We said, we're asking you to read one chapter from five different textbooks in the way that you normally would using the software and hardware that you would normally use. And we realized that these topic areas might be outside of the area that you're study studying. So what we did is we said, you know, for each of the chapters, there's a few questions on the content. We're not testing your intelligence. Don't feel bad if you have a tough time answering the questions. But fill out the areas um, 
where the content is hard to understand or it's likely that the content is not accessible or very accessible. So, for example, we ask content-related questions for users to find information like what is the definition of Weber's law or what is the population of Sweden so that the testing became a bit more realistic and it gave some focus to reading various textbook chapters. And then when we were putting together the feedback forum, we took um, a look at a number of user design surveys and what we noticed is that we had difficulty describing the concept of layout. So we forgot to include keyboard accessibility as a section. Um, see here, sorry. So this is a group of students um, that we got together. And as facilitators, I have to say we were a bit nervous about doing the focus group because for all of us, this was our first time um, conducting user testing or focus groups. And we were working with a group of students who were low vision or blind. Um, so we went ahead and ran our plans through um, a, a colleague at Caper BC who runs the adaptive technology organization and he's actually blind. So we wanted to make sure we didn't miss any key accessibility points. So as you can see, five students attended the focus group and they all had visual or have visual impairments and they were all using different assistive technology. So voiceover on an iPad, uh, Voice over on a Mac, JAWS on Windows laptop, Zoom text on a Windows laptop, and Kurzweil on a Windows laptop. They were from three different universities and had different majors, so art, English, computer science, business, and an occupational therapist. And um, the, we ended up learning a lot. It was a really great group of students who were super engaged and um, we went through the written feedback and we pulled out things that people identified as problems or where one would, student would say it was fine, but another student would say it wasn't accessible to them. So we were really able to flesh out a lot of things that weren't working and, and really ask the questions of, well, how did you do that? And so some of the students were able to highlight some um, accessibility issues we hadn't anticipated. So for example, the English book has some embedded YouTube videos that JAWS didn't read. And we didn't anticipate that when poetry was enlarged using Zoom text, it would be really hard to scroll horizontally to the end of the line. So the formatting issue clearly got in the way of them being able to feel the flow of the poem. Um, so sometimes the reading the students' feedback didn't really make sense to us because we weren't sure what they were referring to. But when they actually showed us what the problem was, it helped us better understand it. Let's see here. So things that um, the students said um, as feedback, they just said that they loved being a part of it and uh, to, you know, they wanted to be consulted on so many things. Um, and they just thought that the uh, understanding and awareness of what we were doing was very appreciated. So as a result of all of the um, testing that we did with the students, we went ahead and uh, created a toolkit. And so what we wanted to do was to really identify who is the audience. So the purpose of the toolkit was that it would be designed with the faculty, content creators, instructional designers, and ed techs in mind. And so the idea was you may not know what you don't know. Um, about making materials accessible. So the, the, in our mind, the audience wasn't always familiar with proactive strategies of universal design as they applied to accessibility. And um, they may, rather than doing the work, would just refer the student to um, the Accessibility or Disability Resource Center. So there's a few things that we wanted to do in terms of why we were doing this. We wanted to um, ensure that we were looking at accommodation for students with disabilities. We'd be looking at principles of universal design, and we want to make sure that the materials were really accessible. And so then we started looking at what should be included in that. Um, we didn't want to overwhelm anyone with information. And so one of the things that um, was really important as we worked through this was Although the W3C guidelines are excellent and was a great starting point for us, we found them a little bit difficult to actually understand and um, 
to work through. It seems like a bit too much information if you're a faculty member just trying to make your resources open or if you're an instructional designer trying to guide a faculty in doing that. And so we decided we wanted to use language that was a bit more um, commonplace, I guess you could say, a bit more usable. So we decided also that we would make the toolkit available in press books. Um, and we wanted this available because we wanted to say, you know, model it on the behavior of where our faculty were developing their materials, but also it allowed us to export the toolkit in a variety of different formats. So you can access the toolkit at opentextbc.ca slash accessibility toolkit. And I'm going to walk you through some screenshots because I don't want to have to try to get through there. I'll put the link up later too for you. Oops. So the accessibility toolkit starts off with key concepts. So we talk about what does it mean to um, work in the concept of universal design for learning. And then we decided we were going to create user personas. So we took each, um, we, we took um, each type of disability that's often seen in disability services, and we created a user persona. So we named that person, we described what type of background they would have, what are some of their issues that they may encounter, and so you'll see these as they go in, as they work through the chapters. And then the best practices is really the, con the content of the material. And so we looked at organizing content, images, tables, web links, multimedia, formulas, font size, and color contrast. And so as you can see here as an example, for uh, we, we always start off with each chapter, who are you doing this for? So who is a, what type of person are you actually accommodating? So this example that we say is, um, does the student have, is he blind or have low vision? Um, and so it gives you an image of what that student would be doing. And then it says, for example, here are ways to look at functional images and alt text descriptions. And then we provide an example. So we go ahead and talk about best practices, but then we also put in the example of how this is working. So as it, sorry, as I said, we do introduction and context. Who are you doing this for and what do you need to do? Um, and then our next step is basically we've been incorporating the toolkit into the development process for all new textbook creators. So the toolkit is available to anyone. We're currently in the process of making corrections to any existing textbook. Um, and we've been implementing that through user feedback and contributions. We've been adding some more um, content within the chapters and we actually have a French version that will be available uh, by the end of the month. So we're really excited about that. We're also conducting some user testing for the trades books, and this testing will take place in the new year. We're testing uh, based on learning disabilities. And uh, we also have started a community of practice for uh, people who are interested in universal design and accessibility issues. So you can contact um, Sue Donor if you're interested, because it doesn't just have to be within BC. So thank you very much, and I will pass it on over back to Una. Hopefully that, that was right on time for you. Yeah, <laughs> nice job, Amanda. Uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat window which we'll let you type in answers to, and uh, we can uh, review those at the end if you'd like to as well. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. Really, really excellent to hear about your toolkit and all the great work that continues to go on in BC, uh, British Columbia. Uh, now, next up um, is Emily Moore, and she's going to talk to us about those amazing FET interactive simulations and the work that they are doing to make sure that they're accessible to all students. Emily? Hi, yes. Um, yeah, here we go. So I'm going to start by introducing the FET simulations project for those of you that may not be familiar with it. I'm going to talk then about our approach to accessibility, our progress so far, and some of the challenges we've run into. And then I'm going to end with some tips and resources that you can use this week in your classrooms if you wanted to. 
So the FET Interactive Simulations Project includes a suite of over 130 interactive math and science simulations. They're used over 75 million times a year, and each one is a free, flexible, exploratory learning tool. They've also been translated into over 70 languages. The FET project uh, engages in both design of these simulations and also research into their use and how to best design them. Some of the things that make our simulations unique is that they're highly interactive, so they uh, encourage students to learn by doing, by actually uh, interacting with all the features in the simulation. They provide real-time feedback, so students use and interact with each slider, each object, each uh, toolbox. Um, they're given uh, real-time feedback that helps them um, explore and connect the ideas that the simulation uh, is designed to cover. They allow difficult or impossible actions, so they allow you to do things in the classroom that would be very difficult or impossible to do in a hands-on activity or lab. They all show multiple representations, which allows students to use representations that they're familiar with to help them understand representations that they're not familiar with. Each simulation is designed to be intuitive, and we do that through iterative interviews with students, so we see what's working and what's not working with real students. And each simulation is implicitly scaffolded to support student inquiry. So it starts with a, a foundational core idea and then builds up from there as students uh, interact with the teachers. The mission of the FET project is to advance STEM education worldwide through three interactive simulations. And their simulations engage students in exploration and discovery, uh, help students develop robust conceptual understanding, help make them accessible, understandable, and enjoyable, and help empower students to direct their own learning by learning through doing with the tools. We also want our simulation to be available for all students. We want them to be intuitive and easy to use so they're not overwhelmed um, by the content. We want them to be freely available online and offline for those that may have difficulty with internet access. And we want them to be flexible for teachers. Uh, so they don't come with a particular curriculum that you must use them with. They can be um, grabbed and dropped into any particular curriculum that you're using, and they can also be embedded in other resources um, like open textbooks. So now we're going to talk more specifically about sets and accessibility. Um, we're taking an inclusive design approach, and a couple of core ideas to inclusive design is that accessibility is incorporated into the design and development process from the start. So we're not 100% there yet, but we're getting there. And we're getting there as quickly as we can because this is very important to us. Uh, another core idea is accessibility features are added as layers. So there's not a separate version that's an accessible version of the simulation. Um, as they're published, it'll be you know one, one simulation for everyone, a one size fits one approach. So, so the, the features are added as layers that can be turned on or off or adjusted as needed. And everything that I'm going to show you today is, is a peek behind the scenes. Um, so starting in spring 2016, we'll start rolling out simulations that have these inclusive features. Um, but we're not quite ready uh, yet, but I'm going to show you some uh, a demo here in just a moment uh, of uh, one of them. So more specifically about the accessibility features we're working on, uh, we're working on keyboard navigation, auditory descriptions for screen readers, Sonification, which is the use of non-speech sounds to convey information, text-to-speech, pinch-to-zoom, and color contrast control. Uh, we're also creating professional development guides and videos, as well as inclusive classroom activities that make use of these features. And we'll have those all available for free on the FET website as resources for teachers. I'm also engaged with a number of collaborators around research with these inclusive features, uh, including research on on how to design these features effectively to work well with diverse populations of students, and also how to use these inclusive simulations effectively in classrooms, particularly with student groups. So there's two main features that we're really focusing on trying to get uh, uh, implemented into as many simulations as quickly as possible. And those two features are keyboard navigation, which allows full access to all of the sim elements just by using the keyboard. And this is really beneficial for students who are blind, have low vision, or have some mobility issues. We're also focused on auditory descriptions, which is 
uh, descriptions provided of all the sim elements, all of the interactions, and all of the changes that happen in the simulation. And this is particularly beneficial for students who are blind, low vision, or also those who have certain learning disabilities. And again, so these are the features that you'll be able to see and play with with more of our simulations starting in uh, spring of 2016. So now I'm going to show you a live demo of one of these uh, simulations with keyboard navigation. So this is a forces in motion basic simulation. It's a, a physics simulation that's used across middle school, high school, and college level classes. It has four different screens that covers different ideas related to forces in motion. But today we're just going to look at this uh, net force screen. So here you can see a cart that has ropes attached that can pull the cart to the left or to the right. You can add pullers to the cart. And as you add pullers, you can see a vector representation that shows the magnitude and direction of the force that these pullers can apply to the rope. You can also play a tug of war game and see that the side that can apply the most force is the one that wins the tug of war. So I was able to show you that really quickly with my uh, using my mouse. But now I'm going to use, going to reset, and then I'm going to use my keyboard. So when I press the tab key, a blue focus box appears around the pullers and shows me all the things I can interact with. I can also use shift tab to go backwards through uh, the keyboard navigation order. I can select uh, pullers, place them on the rope, just as I did with my mouse. And we can play the same tug of war game, but this time I only use the tab key, the shift key, enter, and arrow keys to do this. I'm going to go back to my slides. So hopefully that demonstration looks relatively straightforward. But there are a number of really large challenges in making interactive tools accessible. And I'm going to talk about uh, technical challenges and some design challenges. And there's also some research challenges that I won't have time to speak about today. But if you want to know more, you're welcome to contact me about that or to ask me some questions at the end of the talk about that. So to understand some of the technical challenges that we're overcoming, um, it's helpful to know a little bit about HTML and HTML5. So HTML5 is a modern markup language that allows the simulations to be run in the browser and it allows them to be used across platforms. So they can be used on PCs, Macs, tablets, and phones. And in fact, this is the only way to make one simulation that can be used across all of these different platforms. When that started about 15 years ago, we made all of our simulations in Java and Flash. But in 2013, we transitioned to making simulations only in HTML5 and also transitioned to porting our our uh, Java and Flash simulations in HTML5. And our web state right now has about 29 sims available uh, in uh, this cross-platform HTML5. When you think about HTML and HTML web pages, um, HTML web pages have, as part of their um, underlying markup, uh, various tags like headers and sections and articles and footers. Um, that assistive technology can speak. So there, it has this underlying structure that assistive technology can recognize. And this allows navigation uh, through web pages and also allows skimming. So someone using a screen reader, for example, can navigate from header to header or from link to link. So you can add some extra bells and whistles, some, some extra nice features into your HTML um, to make it easier and more user-friendly for assistive devices. Um, but even basic HTML has um, have these tags that assistive technology can recognize. Unfortunately, the way that you make HTML5 as simulations and other interactive learning resources, um, they're not structured like web pages. Uh, assistive devices cannot recognize any of the internal structure and cannot provide out of the box any access to this content. So essentially, if you take one of our simulations that are on the FET website right now and try to, for example, uh, listen to it with a screen reader, you're not really going to hear anything. Uh, the screen reader can't see inside the simulation at all. So what we've had to do over the past year is to figure out how to address this challenge. Uh, and so we've tried a number of different ways, working with different collaborators to figure out different um, strategies for addressing this. And the one that we found to be best 
is to essentially um, do uh, kind of a trick, which is to create a web page like uh, underlying structure that's generated by the simulation that can communicate with assistive devices. Um, and it's generated on the fly and changes every time you interact with the simulation. So we kind of make a fake web page like thing that can speak with a screen reader or a screen magnifier. And this was a, a really huge hurdle that required um, a lot of collaborative efforts across multiple countries to figure out how to get this to work well. Uh, and we figured it out. We're still refining, um, but we're really proud of this. And this will serve as a model for other interactive resources uh, and other development groups going forward. The benefits to this, this approach are many, but some of them are it allows us to, where standards exist, uh, to apply those standards in this web page like parallel structure and also allows us to keep the accessibility structure consolidated in one place so as standards evolve new standards are developed for things specific to interactive simulation we'll be able to update and maintain them um, more easily so while we've been addressing some of those technical issues we've also been addressing some design challenges and a couple of those are uh, it's actually really difficult to design consistent, intuitive accessibility features across so many different simulations where each simulation is unique and so dynamic. They don't have a similar layout necessarily. They don't have a similar interaction style. For example, some of our simulations, you know, being able to rub a balloon on a sweater is um, important. And some of our simulations, being able to build something is important. So making sure that when students come to our simulations, they don't have to learn new navigation each time is important to us and something we're working very hard on. It's also difficult to design layers to play well together. Uh, so, for example, we want to have um, keyboard navigation where someone who's visually use, uh, exploring the simulation, but using the keyboard to do that has just as intuitive and, and useful a learning experience as someone who's using keyboard navigation and also using a screen reader. And this has turned into a really interesting intellectual challenge also. We have a number of uh, undergraduate students, for example, right now that are doing thesis projects looking at this um, layering together of different um, accessibility uh, features and how they can work well together. And we really see these challenges as opportunities. We're really proud to be breaking new grounds in accessible interactive learning resources, and we are actively and freely sharing our code, our process, and all of our designs with the broader educational technology community. Um, so I uh, just described uh, an introduction to the FET simulations project and our mission to provide um, free, accessible, increasingly accessible interactive simulations to students. I talked about FET's approach to accessibility and our goal of inclusive design and the accessible uh, design from the start. And I talked about some of the challenges in making these things accessible. And so I want to wrap up with um, a few tips and resources that while you wait for um, uh, some of these accessibility features to roll out uh, this spring and for other interactive resources to be able to implement these sorts of uh, inclusive design strategies, while you wait for that, there's some things that you can do in your classroom uh, right now to help make use of interactive resources um, more inclusive for your students. And so one of those is, and this is useful for any resource, is to ask your students and be explicit about this. Ask them to tell you if they're having any trouble with any resource. Are they having trouble downloading it? Are they having trouble hearing it? Are they having trouble understanding what it's doing? And indicate this to students in multiple ways. They can contact you in your office hours by email um, to provide a couple different ways so students can find a way that's comfortable to let you know about their needs. If you're using an interactive resource in lecture, uh, describe pedagogically relevant actions and outcomes and be specific. Avoid using language like notice what happens here or see what just happens there. It can be helpful to think about your descriptions linearly or as nested lists. There's been a lot of work in image description. Um, so using nested lists to, to describe difficult, um, complex images. And so you can use a similar strategy to think about descriptions for interactive simulations. Um, so thinking about, for example, uh, describing your resource from left to right or from top to bottom or from a more uh, 
simple um, foundational idea and then building up in complexity from there. If you're providing your resources online, um, for example, someone tells you they're having difficulty with it, one thing that can be helpful is to make a short screencast where you describe students what's happening and making that available to them. There are many ways to, to make uh, screencasts for free using software that you can download. And um, there's also, particularly if you're just making a few short screencasts, um, there are some, some pretty straightforward ways of providing captioning for those also. And I would um, definitely consider having students work with Sims or any other interactive content in groups. Um, you can prompt students to be explicit about their needs in their groups and to support each other and, to, and make it clear that, you know, it's important that they complete the task as a group, but also it's important to be working together as a group and to be helping each other and recognizing when there's an issue and being able to say very clearly if you need something done more slowly or you need something described verbally. And that sort of thing. So here are a list of some resources. If you want to learn more, you can find all of our simulations uh, for free at vet.colorado.edu. And if you want to learn more about some of our accessibility work and to play around with some of our prototypes, uh, you can find that in the second link here. But you can also find uh, a video of me doing a similar demo as to what I showed you before, and also introducing some ideas about auditory description for screen readers. Um, and if you want to know more about using simulations in the classroom in general, uh, we have a teacher resources section that has videos, guides, and we have hundreds and hundreds of um, free activities that teachers have provided and that we've created uh, to be used with our simulations. And also feel free, get involved. Um, if you or anyone you know uses uh, an assistive device when you're using a computer, please contact me. We'd love to have more people in our pool of user testers. You can also follow our progress and learn about new simulations that are being published on Twitter, Facebook, we have a blog, and we also have a newsletter. Um, so this, uh, our efforts in accessibility have been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, and the University of Colorado Boulder, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and I'm also very grateful for you for listening. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Emily. That was um, really exciting to hear about. Uh, just a couple of questions um, that are in the chat window. No, but since we finished up, we can um, just uh, <laughs> I see applause. Big applause for both of our presenters today. Um, and uh, one of the questions was, is there a code repository on GitHub for the HTML framework? And that was targeted at you, Emily. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, for sure. All of our HTML5 work uh, is available on GitHub. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. All righty. Before we go to our general Q&A here, um, I just wanted to mention that we, um, the Open Education Consortium, which is our parent organization, um, is sponsoring a webinar on Monday at 10 a.m. on adaptive learning. Um, and this is featuring Norman Beer from Carnegie Mellon, who's the director of the Open Learning Initiative, and also the Simon Initiative, which is about open learning analytics. Um, and we will also have Dustin Silva, who's a math faculty at College of the Canyons and has been teaching with the Open Learning In Initiative co courseware um, for several years, and he's going to tell us about how that experience has been going. Um, and um, I know there is another open webinar on Friday with Open Oregon, and I'll let Amy post that in the chat window if she hasn't done that so far, because um, that looks like a really exciting webinar, too, on OER. Um, and I think that we'll just go to general Q&A now. Um, Amanda, I may have missed. Did you have any questions that you wanted to uh, repeat and give the answer to again? Um, I don't think so. I think um, that uh, the answers were really geared towards more of the reviews, so I'm, I think it's fine. Okay. All right. Great. Um, 
So we are open for questions. You can either you can grab your mic by clicking on the talk button. This is for all of our um, audience members. You can uh, click on the talk button and you can uh, ask questions directly to Emily or Amanda or myself, or you can simply type in the chat window. So this is Emily. I had a question for Amanda, if that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Amanda. So I am uh, would love actually to learn any um, lessons you learned about effective user testing with students with visual impairments. Now we've begun doing this, and we've never done this in focus group style or done it individually. And I'm curious if you um, would do do things different the second time around if something went it, uh, unexpectedly? Uh, that's a great question. I noticed that my audio is a little bit messed up here, so apologies. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, basically, we came to the focus group really I don't, I don't know, want to say naively. I mean, we really had never never done anything like this before. And so um, in a way that worked out in our favor because we were able to ask the questions that I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily always ask. And so um, I think there's two things that made it a success. One is providing the students enough time ahead of time to really understand what it was we would be testing and to do that in a written format. Um, that was super important for um, the students to feel like they weren't rushed or anything and to know that they could use any format uh, or any device that they normally use. So having them be comfortable in that arena. And then in terms of the questions and conversations, um, in the focus group it really, honestly the question of, well, why did you do that? Why, why, why? That, that was the key. I don't know if we would do anything differently per se. I think it's just um, knowing that creating the environment to make the students feel comfortable, accepted, and really understanding why it was we wanted their feedback. That seems to be the most essential. Thank Great. you, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. We and um, Emily, we had a question for you from Kayleen. Um, she was curious to hear about how instructors have integrated set simulations into their course. Have they given you any feedback on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, instructors use the simulations in lots of different ways. Uh, they sometimes use them as part of their lecture, as a lecture demonstration. So they'll project the simulation up for the class to, to see and then do experiments with the simulation in front of them. Uh, they can also uh, create clicker questions around that, so set up scenarios and then ask a clicker question about what students think are going to happen next. And then they can um, actually see in, in real time what happens next and discuss answers for the clicker question. Um, some teachers provide them as online resources. Um, uh, I've worked really closely with a number of teachers who use them as part of um, guided inquiry class uh, group activities, so where they create um, guided inquiry paper-based handouts and have students work in groups with the simulation. Uh, we have a number of those sorts of activities on our website. Um, yeah, and we do hear a lot of feedback. So the project's been around for about 15 years. Um, we get lots and lots of emails. Uh, so people find an issue or just want to tell us about a cool way they're using the simulation. Uh, they can email that help at colorado.edu, so we get lots of um, feedback about what's working well and what's not, not working well. And we do go back if people find something that's um, uh, confusing or difficult for their students, we will go back to the simulations and make adjustments. Thank you, Emily. And I, I have a quick question for you. This is Una. Um, what, what percentage would you say are K through 12 versus, say, college or university who uh, of faculty who use your materials? Do you have a sense for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we've been trying to learn more about that. So the project started in college, at college level, making college level simulations. And then over the years, we learned that uh, teachers in K-12 uh, classrooms were um, using them with their students. 
And so about five years ago, we started developing um, simulations specifically targeted at middle school level population. Um, so our K-12 youth has been growing, but it's a bit hard to track. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't tell you a number, but I, I definitely would say that K-12 usage is growing. Very interesting. Well, I hope that I hope that the uh, community college uh, population is growing too, uh, based on mm -hmm. our webinar today. Because this is very exciting. All right. Well. I don't see any other questions in the chat window. Um, we will hang around here for a few more minutes. Um, but I will probably turn the recorder off at this time. And before I do that, once again, I want to thank uh, my amazing presenters today. Thank you very much, Amanda and Emily. Um, I learned a lot, and I, and I think our audience probably did as well. Um, these are just amazing projects. So thanks so much. And, and thank you to all, who, all of you who came today. Um, we really enjoy putting on these webinars, and um, I know many of you write and let us know how much you appreciate them, and um, we plan to continue to do this. So thank you very much, and um, have a great afternoon.